Avi Barzeev designed, among other things, the shape of the primitives that would make up the world of second life. Imagine getting to build the, the atoms, the building blocks of a virtual universe that would go on to be used to make billions of different things. Pretty cool. Before that, he was co-founder of a company that would later become, uh, whose technology would later become Google Earth. And after Second Life, he was pivotal in the design of the HoloLens and also worked on the Apple Vision Pro, which we'll talk about in this podcast. And most recently, he created the XR Guild, which is a group of engineers and others creating ethical standards for the use of VR and AR devices. Avi is the perfect example of the kind of person we need a lot more of right now, a brilliant engineer with a big heart. So let's start with a question where we like zoom the virtual microscope in all the way to the tiniest atoms that make up a world, right? And in the case of Second Life, you are the person who designed the primitives that we now use to build stuff in Second Life today. So like, how did you do that? What was that? What do you remember? What was that process like? Um, I, I remember you asking me, you said, I have this list of 15 or 20 primitives. How long is it going to take to do each one? <laughs> and I looked at the list and then I had had the good fortune of taking computational geometry in college. So I was really interested in computer graphics. So computational geometry has all the theories and all, all, the, all the axioms around this. And I said, well, those are all the same object. You know, they're just, they're just distortions of the same object. They're, they're topologically equivalent. And so I, was like, I could write one piece of code that will make all of these. And that was lucky that I'd had that experience and, and had that, that knowledge and was able to write 200 lines of code that treat each primitive exactly the same way. Every primitive is made out of a 2D profile, which could be a square or a circle right. or any shape you want and then an extrusion along a path to make it 3D. So it's 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 like, you know, surface of revolution or swept, swept surfaces, they're all effect effectively similar. And it made it so flexible that you could have come up with a hundred different shapes if you wanted to. And then you also wanted the twist and the cut and the inner radius and all the stuff. That was, that was actually really easy to add and fun. And the hardest thing was just making sure all the geometry was well-formed. There were no no gaps or holes or that, that took a little time, but the, the basics of it were, we're, we're super easy. What and, and isn't that like a classic engineering moment where you're like, how do I not write yeah. a whole bunch of code that could have bugs or whatever, right? You were like, no, wait a second. I'll just sweep this path through space exactly. and then it'll make a 3D thing. I remember that was such a wonderful thing. And, and also it seems like um, with virtual worlds and with like building environments in general, right? There's always this question of like, how do you build uh building blocks that are the right trade-off between like being capable of doing many things or making many shapes or whatever and easy enough for people to use because i think you know when second life got started that was at a time in history where even less people had done anything with 3d editing right, right. and so the idea of like making shapes in three dimensions out of like triangles you know was yeah. an even more primitive problem so to speak and so we had to really yeah get it right. it, i think it's a good approach because it's kind of like legos right it's like the mm -hmm. whole world is going to be made out of a, a hundred different blocks and you can really customize these even more than legos but once you get the basics if you can stick anything on anything then you can pretty much build anything right so so it, it you can prove that it's sufficient to be able to build any world you want to build at whatever level of chunkiness like people have built really amazing worlds in minecraft and all you get to do is blocks like only squares essentially yeah, when you compare like Minecraft, right, with its, it's an automata in a sense. I like to think of Minecraft as an automata, a yeah. type of automata where you've got what, like, I think 255 or something. I think there's one byte of like what material this block right. is, and then those blocks are interacting with the ones adjacent to them. But I guess when you think about it from a shape building perspective, yeah, like what are your, what did you think when you later saw Minecraft? Well, I, I, I said, I, actually, I wish I had done that because <laughs> it was, it was, I probably would have never come up with the whole 8-bit aesthetic because that, you know, yeah. being a, being a child of, of arcade games and Ataris and, and Amigas and things like that, I always wanted more fidelity. I never wanted to go back to, to low res, but 
But um, the mm -hmm. idea of just making a grid and essentially just doing a voxel renderer for a grid and really big voxels, right? I think was was kind of genius. And it just made it super easy for people to sculpt those worlds, right? You didn't even have to think about about where to place things. It just had one choice, the choice of what goes in this in this cube. What kind of cube is it going to be? And you could make a blocky world, but you could still make anything. And that's where Minecraft, I think, really took off was when people started showing all the worlds they built, right? It wasn't so much the yeah. game as it was mostly kids building re these really intricate worlds and sharing them with their friends. And a lot of it was static. Even the autonomous part was even less important than just, look, I, I made the Taj Mahal out of out of out of blocks and and you could do some really amazing things and people did similar things at second life as well you could recreate almost anything um, using those primitives right that 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 you didn't have to resort to meshes to do everything yeah. people wanted meshes right because it gives you more flexibility but you didn't have to you could and then the prims as you designed them were a kind of an in between right, right. they were a they were a place that was between like a voxel and a mesh because right. you had this funny shapes you could link them together. You could resize them. You could you could do almost anything. I can remember. I have to say, I remember shortly after you built that system, and we had the, the primitives more or less as we know them today. I think pretty much exactly as we have them today in Second Life. Um, I tried to build like a sports car. I was trying to build like an Italian sports car, sort of a thing, and yeah. I spent like all day delighted by the fact that I could approximate like a hood or a fender with what you had done pretty well, you know? And so I ended up with something that was probably like, you know, 50 parts or something glued together to mm -hmm. make what looked like, I mean, probably it would be funny now if we could bring it up on the screen and see it, but to make something that looked a lot like a, a curvy little sports car. Yeah. And I felt like there was just enough, you know, creativity there like i could really look at it when i came back and say oh yeah that's mine that's what i built you know and isn't isn't that really an element of what we're trying to do with all creative systems today right is put a little bit of ourselves into it but just enough yeah where it doesn't get too hard but you can make something that's uniquely yours that's the key is that you have to you have to give people enough control so that they can make what's in their mind. They, they have a picture of it. They may not even know what they want. They may be doing it iteratively as well, but they still need that level of control, but not so much control that you have to do all the mundane details, right? If you think about like the holodeck is the ultimate fictional exploration of this is I can go into the holodeck and say, you know, computer 1920s bar, and it knows exactly what I mean somehow with just a few words. And you're seeing glimmers of this with, with Gen AI, but it's not what I had in mind. It's just doing it for me. It's doing it whatever the sort of common average is of what, what everybody right. else would have done. And, and we need something a little different than that, too. We need, we need something which is it lets me be creative. It lets me express myself, but also makes it as easy as possible. So I don't have to do the grunt work. I don't have to lay the tiles or the wood floor or paint the walls. The computer can do that part for me. But I do need to be able to say, that's not right. I don't want this to be like this. I want it to be like this other thing. Iterative iterative and comparative because yeah. i think the way a lot of people think is not that they have an exact picture in mind but they're like i want it to be have elements of this thing that i saw and elements of this other thing that i saw but only the right elements pulled together not the average of the two things i want it right. to be you know indicative of each of the things that i thought about and have their characteristics but blended together and, and we're, no, we're not quite there yet you know i think about how development of things is often a time series right like you can think about human agency and human creativity as almost inevitably being a call and response thing where i do something and then you do something else and i do something and obviously second life i think literalized that in a compelling way because you could actually build like right on top of somebody else's table right. somebody could build a table and you could build a clock on top of the table and that was pretty amazing yeah. i remember there was a guy in second life i don't know if you remember this video but he did that vincent van gogh painting mm -hmm. and it was like he framed up the camera basically and it was sort of framing the painting you didn't really get it at the beginning of the video but he started but you saw his avatar like super high speed flying around and very quickly building it took him like a month to do i think in reality putting all the primitives in place and building out what then through the lens ended up being exactly starry starry night yeah um, uh, so it was a time series and I think you're right. Like, I guess when I think about using something like mid journey to build in 3d, like once that, like once the technical details or the, the compute level or whatever, we need to actually get good looking 3d things out of something like a mid journey. W once you can say, you know, make me a 1920s bar. Yeah. It seems like 
the way a person builds something of their own is to then iteratively change it, right? Yeah. Like, okay, I want the bar, but I want roses on the table over there. Exactly. And you got to be able to do that. Exactly. And 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 some of the decisions the computer makes along the way, just because it's it's picking almost randomly in some, some ways, may get in the way of what you had in mind. So, you, it, it, you know, now we have positive prompts and negative prompts and all these constraints you can start to add. But being able to build up the context and the iteration, I think, is going to be the most important thing, especially when you want to have multiple people collaborating, because it's it's a conversation. It's not it's not like a take a photograph of what's in my mind. Is it a text conversation? I mean, we've mm. seen this weird idea that we're supposed to talk to computers now with text or type or even speak with a you know GPT uh, app or whatever. It is is like voice or text the right way to build three dimensional worlds? Not so much. I think I think that it's. It's the easiest way to just say a few things and have it work and have it do something. So if I just said 1920s bar, something would happen. I'd get it right now a 2D yeah. image of a 1920s bar. Yeah. Maybe next year I'll get a 3D image of that. But if I want to be able to iterate on that, I don't want to get I don't want the computer to start randomizing everything every time I do a new pass on it. I want it to be able to keep the things I like. And and that's a conversation, but it doesn't have to be done in words. I could I could use my body, my hands to also paint the things I like and change the things I don't like and get in there and have some level of editorial control. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's missing both in in physical or pseudo physical interfaces and voice is context. This is the idea that if I, you know, I grew up in New York. And so when I say a tree, I t tend to think of the trees like in New York. Actually, maybe now that I've been in California so long, I think of a California tree. <laughs> maybe that's been replaced. But but the computer doesn't understand which kind of tree I meant huh. when I say tree or which kind of car I meant. There's there's thousands of types of cars. How would you know just by saying car? So the thing about language is that it's stripped out so many details, right? We make all these assumptions when we talk because usually we're talking to someone else who's in the same context as we are. Oh, right. And they could just see the car I'm talking about. And so the computer is missing that still. But if we get to a point soon where the computer can understand our backgrounds, our histories, and if there's an ongoing conversation, what do we mean when we both say car? Then it can start to do a better job of picking, of, of selecting what we what we mean it, from, from data. It does seem that understanding each other is, is, is importantly connected to context and even to spatial context, right? Yeah. Like the fact that we're in the same room together right now does all these things. Like I've always been interested through Second Life in how people that were sitting in the same room together are going to be like nicer to each other and they're going to have some preconceived uh, uh, connections, right, between yeah. each other that are just imposed by the room. A even if it was just some weird, crazy room somebody else built that we both just walked into, we suddenly feel more connected yeah. just as we do right now in, in this rather, you know, un uninteresting room. But nevertheless, we're, we're in it together. Uh, I think that aspect of creating context, like you say, is important both for the AIs to understand us, but also like for us to understand each other. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, think about all of us have had this experience of sending an email and having somebody take it the wrong way or right. misreading someone else's email because you don't know what they were thinking when they wrote it. And just breaking it down into words strips all that context. It strips the emotion, it strips the tone of voice, it strips the body posture, all the things that we would have seen had we said these things to each other in person. So you can say the exact same words, but but in person, you'll know that I'm saying it because I care about you and I want to be helpful. And in an email, without that context, it might seem like I'm, I'm being a dick, right? In, in the exact same words. So it, it, a lot of it goes into the assumptions that we make, we fill in the blanks, right? We're, we're really good pattern matchers and we will fill in the blanks of the things that we don't know. So right. by being in the same room, we know a lot more. We know a lot more about each other and about the context. And so we can rule out, well, he's not trying to kill me. He's not trying to take my job. He's not, he doesn't hate me. All those things that might've gone through your mind in an email, uh, you can say, okay, those aren't it. Maybe let me try to give it the best possible interpretation. Uh, which is the best trick actually for for communicating in in text is let's just assume the best of what somebody meant uh, you know, because we don't know. Your work has spanned so many areas, and we'll later talk about VR and about you know the Vision Pro or you know about 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 VR in general. But um, do you, you you said like when we reduce something to text, we don't get the nonverbal information. We don't get all the other stuff that goes along with communication, like my hands. Um, do you, what do you think is the most important, like nonverbal means by which we communicate? 
that, 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 that we need to get working or maybe, you know, to get working to make VR work? Um, the facial stuff. I mean, we've talked about this a lot in, in, in various ways. I think that the eyes are super important for, but even hands. I, I'm, I worked with a guy and we had had the time we had avatars that had no hands, just, just controllers. So we would just show the right. controllers because we didn't know what your fingers were doing. So we said, to be honest, we're just right. going to show you the two controllers, controllers only. Yeah. And you know a human's driving them. You can tell that they're, they're, they're driven by human hands because of the way they move. But you can't tell the gesture. You can't tell. And so he, his reaction was he, he could identify that he got nervous because he thought you might be holding a knife. Yeah. He doesn't know. So, so his instinctive reaction is fear if he can't see that your hands are oh, empty wow. and so safe. If you're holding your hand, right. If you're in that, yeah, if you're in that typical, especially from those days of the controller. It's a very similar like, posture to yeah, holding a sword or a knife or anything we used dangerous. In high right? fidelity, right. And you yeah. wouldn't know whether you had an imagined thing. Exactly. That's a really great point. And then also I think about it as like dimensionality, right? With embeddings and AI now, we think about these very, very high dimensional spaces, right? Yeah. And how many degrees of freedom they have. And it's like, yeah, your hands just, have extraordinarily many degrees of freedom, right? When you're able to wiggle your fingers. And I think what we've learned, you know, like through AI is, or we've gotten a better view of is our brains see all that, yeah. you know, like, like if my, you know, if my pinky is moving some funny way when I'm gesticulating and talking to you, you, you will see that and read it as being like, well, that's not what Philip normally does. Yeah. Or, you know, it's not universal, that? right? That's a, it's a cultural thing. Different cultures use their hands. I grew up using my hands a lot and I've yeah. trained myself to do it less. And that was New York. That was New York. So, <laughs> You know, half my family is Israeli, half my family is, is from the New York area. So both are very, you know, very outgoing in, in, the, in the sense of of, of uh, effective communication, right? Affective with an yeah. A. And so there's a lot of gesticulating, raising voices, things like that. And on the West Coast, it's a lot calmer. And so I've had to train myself to do less of it. <laughs> Um, but it is important and we, we cue off each other, but the gestures could be taken the wrong way yeah. in, in different cultures. There's, you know, there's, I think everybody's seen this, like for people from India, there's a head motion that I can't, I won't even try to do it right because it, I'll do it wrong. What does it mean? But it, 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 I think when I've asked people what it means, I didn't grow up there, but when I've asked them, they said, it's sort of a, it's, it's a, it's a mark of deference. Like when I, when I move my head in a certain way, I'm acknowledging you and and accepting that and sort of moving on to the next thing and so uh -huh. it's an unspoken thing somebody could correct me that maybe that's not the right interpretation of it but but that's that's what i've been told and and i wouldn't know that because i didn't grow up there and didn't didn't start with that gesture just like in certain places it's super impolite to point at anything right. or have your hands in the wrong place or if you're if you're very animated people will assume you're nervous as opposed to being calm but for me it's normal there's one that that makes me think of in voice communication. There's that thing that I think happens a lot. I've noticed in Japanese where you make small sounds to tell the person, yes, continue. Yes, continue. Yes, this, continue. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And of course, latency, you know, which is one of my big bugaboos in these systems, latency screws that up so badly. Right. Because you can't do the like, yeah. yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. It comes as an interruption later. <laughs> exactly. Totally, it comes yeah. as that, you know, if it's a quarter second later, it's yeah. an interruption. And uh, yeah, that that's, that's, I, I think one thing that we both saw with, uh, with Second Life and of course, you know, with many other projects, uh, the, it is so interesting when you just jam people into a virtual world and you, you know, of course you don't make any distinction around where they're coming from in the real world so probabilistically you know if you walk into a bar i always say if you walk into a bar in second life you know the probability that the person you're walking up to say is from the same country you're from is very low yeah. you know and and uh, you know there's it, it i guess i guess that's one of the wonderful things about online that i guess we've forgotten in the last few years because now we've concluded that online is just this uniformly horrible thing that's destroying the world right but the first thing that was so interesting about it say in the 90s was that we were always running into people that weren't from around here. Yeah, and 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 those avatars couldn't really capture most of these gestures anyway, right? You had the the, right. the, the keyboard driven dances and things like that, and other gestures you can do, but it wasn't it wasn't tracking your body. So you kind of reduced everything to a neutral set yeah. of common denominators. So that was probably probably better in some ways for being able to communicate with people from other countries because the none of the None of the things that would trip you up were there, but also probably lacked a lot of a lot of the nuances that we would that we would get in person. Some of your work has been um, I'm thinking about XR Guild now mm -hmm. um, has been worrying about I'll say worrying because I think you feel the same way I do about it, that worrying about how we 
negotiate issues like our ability to communicate, you know, with gestures or not, or yeah. use voice or text and being inclusive. There's this delicate trade-off, it seems, between being expansive as to giving people the range to communicate, like we're talking about wiggling our fingers, and then reducing things to a common denominator simple enough to yeah. make everybody able to use it. I think it's one of those things as I get older, I feel like these things don't have easy answers. They don't because, so Second Life clearly took the stance. I, I, one of the ways I think you described it early on to me, which made sense was it's essentially Burning Man, right? We're, we're trying to recreate a virtual version of, of a creative space where everybody can be themselves, but there's not a lot of rules. And I thought that was cool. But then at the same time, you'd say, that's not a place for kids. That's not the place I would take my kids because, yeah. because you know, time to penis and all sorts of yeah. stuff that happen in a world that doesn't have the kind of rules that you would regulate. So as soon as you start thinking about what are you going to do for 10 year olds, 13 year olds, you need a whole different set of, of ideas to come in and say, how are we going to start from a position of safety so that our kids are not uh, traumatized in the same way that we try to make sure that the the park, the, our neighborhood park is safe, that we make sure that there aren't people who are doing drugs or a lot of crime or, you know, uh, whatever. We try to make sure those parks are safe so that our kids can have a place to play that isn't something we have to constantly worry about. Do you, do you think, so you just said two things that I want to look at differently. One of those is worlds for kids versus worlds for adults. Mm -hmm. Another one is like public commons that right. I, you know, because of course that's one of my favorite things and you just touched on it and I know it is for you too. So yeah. let's talk first about kids. Can kids, can kids coexist with grownups in virtual worlds? And then secondly, are virtual worlds like good for kids? I don't think they're great for kids. I think there's a lot of awesome things they can do educationally. But um, what, I, what I always tell parents is think of the virtual world as if it were a real place. Would right. you let your kid out in the real world to do something without your supervision at age X, whatever? Um, and the answer is often no. I wouldn't let them. You know, I I I was a kid in New York, and I remember taking the subway when I was ten years old, and that that was a different time. Today, if I had a ten year old living in New York City, no way would I let them walk around the city by themselves. I would be chaperoning them. Curiously, though, as a side note, right, we're old enough to remember the freedom that we had as kids, which it seems kids don't have today. But everything I've read about crime statistics suggests that kids are actually safer doing those things today than we were. But the perception that we have, because we have greater ways, say, like having our kids have phones where we can see where they are by tracking their phones, right? Yeah. It's almost like we have greater agency and therefore greater awareness and worry about it. But in fact, the kids, I think, statistically speaking, are perhaps like a little bit safer, at least, than we were in the 19, you know, say, 70s. I uh, believe right it. Now. But look, in Gen X, you were pretty much on your own. <laughs> you just yeah. That's the definition of Gen X is I raised myself. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I could have died a million different ways. And I, I survived. That's yeah. sort of the, the motto of, of Gen X is I got this far. Um <laughs> but uh, you know, for for today, I think there's there's more harms that we know about than we thought about back then, uh -huh. right? You know, there was you know the worst thing they could think of on Saturday Night Live was was a bag of glass as a toy, right? That was their <laughs> their worst idea when I was a kid. You bought your kid a bag of glass, um, or Happy Fun Ball, right? Don't talk yeah. Happy Fun Ball. Um, but there are many more things today that we can think of that that are going to damage our kids that that are too easy for them to stumble into. You know, another comment on primitives before we go off of that and you know from your building the second life primitives i rewatched the other night the lego movie which really makes me laugh right like they hit it hard with that i mean yeah. on the one hand it kind of feels like a kid's movie but then it's a very grown-up movie works right and that it's yeah. talking about the decline that i think you and i like remember very well which was that lego you know for those who are younger lego used to be these funny little square bricks and you basically just had an enormous bag of square bricks and you could make whatever you could out of that but everything like minecraft looked like kind of like a square brick yeah. you know so if you tried to make a sphere or the millennium falcon or something it was pretty hard to do with yeah. these bricks and now lego i guess i don't know I, I i you know at least the suggestion in the movie was that lego shifted to a we could make more money by making these very specialized bricks that look really quite cool and look like, you know, some movie character or some, you know, Star Wars thing or something. And then we can sell people these little individualized kits, right? Yeah, and, totally. I yeah. mean, um, you should, if you haven't watched it, watch the documentary too about the Lego company, the, the whole history. Because I, I, I think they almost went bankrupt because they had too big of a diversity 
uh, or too early anyway. Now it's a lot cheaper for them oh. to diversify and have new kinds of bricks all the time. But back then it was a cost issue and they had too many Ooh. different ones and they had to reduce the sets and, and simplify everything. And that was fine for the aesthetic. Uh, and now you're right. Today they have, my son and I do a lot of Lego sets too. I gave him all my Legos from when I was a kid. We kept them. And now, which are regular blocks. Which are mostly basically. the regular blocks. And But then, uh, then uh, we bought a bunch of new sets and most of the new sets we don't disassemble. We assemble them like the Millennium Falcon and then put it on the shelf. A, because it was a lot of work, but B, because they have a lot of those custom pieces that, that could be used for something, but aren't. Uh, yeah. You know, it's and it's it's a really hard thing to be thinking about. Oh, should I take that roller coaster apart? We literally we think we were trying to make a um, we were trying to make a cable car, air you know aerial cable car type thing. Yeah. And oh, and right. and I wound up right. using all these old bricks to try to make the big curves and everything. And then I realized I could just use the new roller coaster pieces, which are awesome, and make a miniature version of this thing. But I didn't want to take apart the roller coaster, so I le I left it as is. I should have bought a few more of those just to just to make it work. And, and there is that's another observation on creativity and maybe on AI, right? That like you thought of repurposing like a part that was new and weird, which was like a roller coaster, putting it upside down or whatever and turning it into a cable car. You know, that that, I, that makes me think of like jumping from one little area of uh, interesting stuff in an AI to like some other area. Uh, Stephen Wolfram recently wrote something about how if you look at slices through uh, a stable diffusion model, you see something interesting and then a vast gray area where there's nothing and then right. something else interesting. And I was just... I don't know. I was endlessly fascinated by the idea of leaping around in the phase space of uh, an AI model and getting from one weird thing to another weird thing. And it's interesting how like Lego blocks, the original ones, push everything down to the atomic scale and all you get is blocks. And yeah. you just got to be happy with that or you have to use enough to make something that's kind of curvy Yeah. Um, versus repurposing weird little twisted new Lego blocks to do something entirely different entirely and, and that's i mean i think for the adults that play with legos that's one of the fun things is figuring out how to use them differently there's all these terms like studs on the side or ways of putting the pieces that they weren't necessarily meant to be uh -huh. but they were designed the engineering was so good and the proportions are so good that you can take pieces and fit them together in ways that don't seem natural but they fit uh because you know the length of this equals the gap of that in, in, in a whole bunch of pieces so you know, the fact that you can take a little black peg and stick a, a flexible hose right in the little tip of it and it fits perfectly is in some ways by design, but also an interesting luck of, of the fact that the math was good, that the, that the engineering was good. You know, another comment on creativity and on what we choose to make, you know, as humans to entertain each other or whatever, it feels like with Minecraft, there was this appealing fact that because the cubes are one meter, and you, you really practically only got so many of them. You know, you're building in a field, which is, you know, 100 meters by 100 meters. There's a limit to how much time you can put into something. Like if you ask somebody in Minecraft to make like a turtle, there are really only so many ways to make a turtle with Minecraft blocks. Of course, there's innumerably many, but like as we imagine it, there's not that many, right? Yeah. But in Second Life, of course, as we both know, uh, you know, if you've got six months to build a turtle uh, with there's the primitives that you design, ways, yeah. there is like infinitely infinitely more ways and exactly. so if you spend the whole six months you're going to come back with a turtle that is like the coolest turtle anyone's ever seen or yeah. completely photorealistic but i always think there's something lost in that because you can go so far with the creative design you're not constrained by anything that you know you can kind of get sucked into it and then you can never competitively build content as good as the person who's really 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 into it yeah so i i think that's another fascinating thought about like as we move forward together into technology, do we build systems that are like kind of more like Minecraft in that they impose a pretty low, they, they impose a pretty chunky limit on what you can really do and how much time you can spend versus something like Second Life where you can just go completely gonzo and spend your whole life working on one little teeny thing. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's all a question of, of you trying to prototype something quickly, right? If you want to do things quickly, then having very simple systems with with those kinds of constraints are great because you can yeah. sketch it out like a you know a pencil and a, and a and a piece of paper is the sim one of the simplest systems we could imagine. You can't do everything with it, yeah. but you can prototype almost anything in two D in a system like that. And in Minecraft, you could prototype almost anything. Then the question is, can I refine it? Can I yeah. make it more polished? Because if I want to 
if I were going to try to, let's say, make a AAA game, I wouldn't want to ship it in Minecraft, even though people could consider that in some ways that, that kind of a game. But, but I wouldn't use it to build my art for the game that I want to see polished, but I could use it to just rough things out and try them. And I think a lot of the design process, especially the part of it that I work on, is all about the trying and the experimentation. So yeah. the rough systems are fine. They're, they're, they're totally usable, but not for final production. I would totally redo it in a better system if I were going to take it to the, to the market. In the, in the same way that you talked about like somebody poking two pieces that shouldn't go together together in Legos, was there ever anything you saw with like Second Life primitives that people had done where you as the creator of the very you know shape model for those primitives uh, were fascinated by or? Um, well, annoyed by in some sense. Like, the, the hardest <laughs> thing, because look, that we're still talking about a time when there were no programmable shaders, right? So right. you had a certain amount of vertices and a certain amount of, of depth complexity that you could render if you were going to try to hit 30 frames per second, which was yeah. a, a miracle if we could. I think when we started, we were getting five frames per second, right? So we had to figure out how are we going to get this thing to run at a reasonable speed? And if you were to try to make, let's say, a snake by overlapping a bunch of spheres, there's a whole bunch of those spheres that are hidden that no one will ever see. They're inside each other. Right. So it always annoyed me that we couldn't, in that time, make a snake because you couldn't do the flexi sort of extrusion prim along a multifaceted length, like a snake length. And one of the things I always wanted to do with the primitives was to take it to the next level to say, it shouldn't just be a, a flat profile and a simple extrusion. The extrusion could be a path. So now you could make something right, like a snake right. and it would have no interior geometry so nothing would be wasted. With those with the sphere approach, you would wind up, or cylinder is equivalent, right? You would wind up throwing away 80% of the of the triangles that you were rendering, you would never see, and that would make your whole world run slowly for everybody who would see it too, not so, just you. So that's a simple example. So you're saying like one of the things you'd go back or or one of the things you'd do differently with Second Life Primitives would be to make the path a uh a modifiable a path, modifiable, right? right? Because Just, then you could make so many interesting that, things. That and, the, and the FlexiPrim kind of did that later. But uh -huh. but I, I I was toying with this idea of something at the time I called complexitives to go with primitives, right? And that was <laughs> rather than just clone an object by copying its literal set of primitives, could we come up with something which was more procedural, more like, like DNA that could procedurally build the object by example? So you build the first instance and it, it doesn't just copy it literally, but it understood here's a spine, here's an arm, here's a leg. And, and then you could take that and mash up that complexitive to yeah. make a, a derivative of an object without having to take it apart. Like this would be very much unlike Legos, right? It's more like the instruction book of Legos than Legos that, that it would let you make things that were reusable and sellable and shareable, but they wouldn't be just combinations of objects. They would be like rule sets that would go with them. So I could make a table and the table might have a couple of dials on it that say, how big should the table be? How tall should it be? What material should it be? And you can play with those procedural things. And we've seen some people go really far with procedural content. Like there's there are a few games that I play with my son now that are just like, you just keep clicking the mouse and it just keeps adding buildings. Right. And it, But it, those buildings always make sense wherever you place them because they get rehashed and connected with whatever's around them using this procedural generation idea. And you can build really complex worlds really quickly. You don't have as much control, but but it, but it takes a lot of the drudge work out of it. But I was always hoping for is that we would. I I, w I wanted to head off where we are now with with all the controversy about people stealing IP from artists when right. when they when they're training models, right. and the fact that people aren't getting paid for their work. Back this was back twenty you know twenty years ago. We're like, look, let's just come up with a way for people to sell both the finished content and also the inputs to the finished content, the intermediate content that is the table that could become any table. But as, as you said, though, that requires, I think there's a word lately, composability in yeah. engineering, which has kind of come back or has kind of come up lately about yeah. this, that you, you want to build with components, right? Not just the appearance, but also the behavior or functionality where you can glue these things together and create a larger ensemble. I, th I think, as an aside, I think that living things also take advantage of this composability in a very important way. But, uh, and, and I think living things was always one of my goals with Second Life was to build a, a world that could have things that were sort of alive in it in yeah. an important way. And I'd still like to see that happen. Um, do, yeah, do, you know, 
as we think about AI, I think one of the things you're saying there is like everybody's concerned about AI's um, training on our stuff and then kind of stealing our value from us and re regurgitating it for us again, right? And, yeah. and we re they really ought to, you know, being as, being as how they're trained on all our stuff, it'd be nice if they knew how to recognize us for that. But it, but as you said, that you think you make an interesting point, which is uh, visual drawings, for example, aren't necessarily very composable, right? right? So if you're an AI and you say, oh, well, well I made this scene from, you know, oh, that Avi, that guy Avi had this amazing table prototype. And, you know, I used a bunch of those to make this scene. But we don't have AIs yet that understand the inputs as composable things, right? right? We, they only, under, you know, in the, in the case of, uh, you know, text to image, they only looked at images. They do in a sense, though, because because if you if you were to take, um, you know, uh I don't take any of them. I won't, I, won't, I won't name them because I know you're, you're an advisor to one. But um, if you were to say, make this in the style of Van Gogh, that's a composability. Style transfer is is a really good example mm -hmm. of composability. And the uh, really horrible example of, of the AI made a beer commercial where, where it's just just wrong in almost yeah. every way. That's that's an that's an example of, of approaching composability, yeah. right? Where the pieces got reused in, in ways that almost made sense, yeah. but were off. Yeah. And... So I think I think all this AI work is going to really enable us to get to composability. But I, what I think that the AI companies need to do is understand. This is one of my uh, five hero principles that if there's a thriving ecosystem and they're making a lot of money, then they need to be the ones to pay the creators or at right. least give credit. No one else is going to do it. So if if they're making a billion dollars on the ecosystem, it, right. the the onus is on them, not just morally but just financially. Yeah to keep the creators creating because they're, they're going to get stale. Everything is going to be yeah. a, a rehash of what was already there unless the creators are making new multi-tables and new start styles of art. And no, everyone's going to get tired of what we have. So, so make the ecosystem, make the money, and then figure out a way to know in the end result how much, how much contribution did each of those inputs yeah. really make? That's yeah. the hard part. Yeah. And I've never had a good solution for that, but it seems like that's the part that AI can solve, which is give me a number for how much credit should we give to Vincent van Gogh, right? For right. the style, uh, I can't say it the right way. The, the name just doesn't come out of my mouth. Yeah. But but um, yeah. how much credit should we give him for the style? Alive or dead, doesn't matter, but we, we should come up with a number that says 5%. For this piece uh -huh. of art, that person deserves 5% of the credit at, of the end result. I don't care if it's if the algorithm is totally perfect, as long as everybody considers it fair and consistent. You talk about style transfer, and now I'm like wanting to go to my computer and type in, make a picture, well, or make a video. I guess we can't do that so much yet with most of these systems, but <laughs> I'm imagining like, make something where everybody moves around as if they were a slinky. Right. And I'm wondering, you know, could the AI, would it understand the idea of slinky, right? And, th and therefore, to your point, would it also say like, well, you know, we owe the slinky. We owe the Slinky creator something exactly. for this, right? Like, do you have that? Are we going to get to that kind of style transfer? I suppose we are, because it does seem that these large language models, at least, do like converge on the same semantics as we have. So right. maybe, maybe the idea of Slinky. I'm I'm dying to figure this out. It'll be interesting. Yeah, I, there's a few. Understand Slinky. There's a few go-to prompts that I try all the time to see how good the AI oh, is. Yeah? And and so far they haven't been able to master these. Like one is, I I take. Uh, you know, Steve Jobs talk about a uh, computer is a bicycle for the mind, right? Uh -huh. And so I want the AI to depict this for me, right? How is yeah. it going to depict it? And the best examples I've seen are human depictions of what that might look like because the AI is is at best going to take it literally, right? And I would be okay if it came back with literally a human brain with arms and legs riding a bicycle. Like take take the take the the you know the most literal. Uh, you know, neurodivergent interpretation uh, of that. And then, but then see if you can do any better than that. Like, what does it really mean to convey the idea of a bicycle for the mind? It's a very hard concept to grasp. I wonder, it makes, that makes me think about another phenomena. I always find that using uh, text to image models feels a little bit frustrating. Sometimes I feel like it's a hash function, right? Like I put in a prompt and I get some incredibly random output, but, but a, a, occasionally the random output is just 
staggeringly beautiful, right? Yeah. And so you're like, oh my gosh, that prompt. But I think the iterative, like I've tried sometimes to compose a scene with a known set of things that I wanted. Like I, th I think I can remember trying something where I wanted two people balancing on a board that was itself balancing on a barrel or something, that kind of idea. Yeah. And I just couldn't explain that. Another one that I've, I've never, I, I challenge anyone listening to this to like try it themselves. Um, you know that idea of looking at yourself in a hall of mirrors, you yeah. know, where there's two mirrors and you're infinitely reflected. I had this thinking about consciousness. So I was trying to write a little draft of a blog about that. And I wanted like that feeling of looking at this infinite recursion of yourself in the mirrors. Yeah. I cannot get a model no. to do it. I think it comes down to the fact that the training data is going to be weak on that, right? That it needs to have seen examples of that to be able to recreate it because it doesn't understand the physics yet well right. enough to be able to actually say what is a mirror. Um, I mean, right. even even nerfs don't really understand mirrors, right? They, um, in most current nerve systems, uh, a, a reflective surface is a hole, and the yeah. geometry is essentially yeah. mirrored on the other side of that, which looks like a mirror, yeah. but you could fly through it. And there's a whole other room on the other side of that of that mirror. You know, as somebody who's an expert in hard things, as you are, I'm sure that doesn't fully capture all the all things obvi. But uh, explain nerfs. Explain nerfs to a person oh, who. Boy. Um, knows 3D graphics, but doesn't really know AI. I, I was at one point, I was an expert in 3D graphics and I made my living at, at consulting companies like like Linden uh, on this stuff. And now it's pretty much ex exceeded my knowledge at, at this point, but I'll do my best to, to, to explain it. Okay. Um, if you you if you start from the end, start from start from the way it's rendered. It's effectively more of a splatting technique. So so it isn't that the world is composed of geometry like polygons and textures like we're all used to if we've done graphics before. It's a little it's a lot more impressionistic in a sense, even though it mm -hmm. might look photorealistic. But it's much more of the computer has these splats of color that get that get recombined, and it's recombined at at the control of of a of a of a, of a, of a, a learned model. Uh, so, so a neural network is essentially computing how this set of splats that are in this local region of space between my hands, how should that look from various angles? Uh, and the fact that it, it works at all is amazing because it conceptually right. seems like I'm just going to be splatting a bunch of things in a scene and the computer is going to pick the, 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 the generation of the, of the splats and how they overlay right. and, and, and but yeah, but it works because it because it's learned enough of of different scenes and it's learned specifically the scene that you're trying to capture. It has enough information there to be able to effectively render it from all perspectives. And that I don't know how better to explain it except for me, I have to think of it more as math. It's it's essentially any any machine learning any neural network is an optimization problem. So what we've essentially encoded is the minimum set of information to be able to draw the room from any angle. If I yeah. if I've captured a room. We've now encoded a way that's better than triangles and 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 uh, you know polygons and texture maps. We've we've encoded a way of capturing the way it might look from any direction, including the thing that makes it look good is the specular reflections. The fact that ah, right. anything shiny looks different depending on the angle that you're looking right. at it, because you have to take into account all the light sources. So they didn't have to tell it about the light sources. That came naturally through from what I see from the algorithm itself, but in a, in a conventional graphic system, you have to do all this extra work to make things shiny. We had, you know, when I started, we had flat shading and then Garo shading and then Fong shading and then better and better shaders. Now we have, we have what's called uh, physically based rendering, which is a lot closer. So you right. can control the shininess and the bumpiness and the, all the anisotropy of, of, of the surfaces, all these controls, but still it looks better if you just do a nerf because it's just capturing the raw, information about what does the scene effectively look like from any angle it's it's a, it's computationally the closest thing we have to a hologram actually in in many ways right a kind of a point cloud yeah instead of a instead of a wave front but yeah that's the same sort of idea where you're moving you know there's this deep deep equivalence between ai models for example human memory and compression which you just touched on like yeah. i've always been struck by how there's this very deep almost uh, I don't know, just incredible correlation between everything and compression. It, it makes like the fact that the show Silicon Valley was like all about compression. Yeah. I think that's funny, right? Yeah. Funny and right, because like in a way, so much of technology is about compression and so much compression is about like matching our memories, right? Like yeah. the way we think is from both an evolutionary and a, you know, living systems development perspective, 
about creating a minimal representation, right? These big models that can generate, you know, so many remarkable paragraphs of text for us do not themselves contain all the source information. They are much smaller. Right. And, 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 but neither does a JPEG or a PNG, right? Those, those, I, right, I think of them, right. the only difference for me between a large language, a large image model, let's say, not a language model, but, and, and, a, and a JPEG is the fact that the JPEG was coded to only recreate one image. But it's, it's, it's taken all the information in that image and reduced it to this minimal set of, 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 of sine waves, right? Cosines. Yeah. Um, and a combination of those waves is what recreates the image. But the JPEG never really stores the image. It's only storing the coefficients right. that go there. That's why it's so small. And, but the same thing with, a, with, a, with any of these machine learned models is they're only storing the coefficients and the weights of something that yeah. has a lot of assumptions baked in. It's the assumptions are there based on all the things that it's already seen, all the things that it can it, it effectively is good at figuring out the patterns. It's figuring out the repeatable elements yeah. of the universe that don't need to be stored yeah. because they can be inferred and invoked uh, later from some prompt. And it's almost like we started doing compression. You know, I worked on um, I worked on video. I, I worked. I shouldn't even call it compression. I worked on transmitting video over a modem connection on the early internet, and that's what got my kind of career started. Yeah. And so I didn't have any compute compared to what we have today. So I had to do stuff that like didn't use cosine functions right. and things like that. Because <laughs> we didn't have time on a 486, you know, yeah. to do that kind of thing. You're packing bits at that point, but, right? Yeah, you're right. Like that makes me think like when you look at compression, it's like the earliest compression schemes we did sort of treated the whole world as blocks of pixels or sine waves that were added together in Fourier analysis, right? But yeah, like, but, but of course, JPEG can store and cleanly represent with a low signal to noise ratio any image, including images that only aliens have ever seen, right? right. Whereas the, the beauty of a language model or a model in, in, or a brain is that we uh, organize things using the building blocks of what we've already seen. And so it's this terse subset of the universe of possible images stored in a maximally efficient way. And it's so cool that it seems like we're I guess getting all the way to what our brains do now. You know, yeah, I it's guess, it's yeah. A, like a symbolic representation, right? Like that. I was probably the only person that thought of it this way because it's weird. But I always thought of a of a video card essentially as a decompression engine. That's exactly the way I thought of it. Is you're you're giving it a, a compressed format, which is polygons, vertices, texture totally. maps. And its job is to take that and decompress it into into images. And the beauty of a 3D graphics card is you can do it from any angle. You know, you don't have to. It doesn't have to know the perspective ahead of time, and it can deform it, and it can change it, and things can be animated yeah. in that data set. And a lot of compression formats can't. Like, you, it's very. It, there's no movie format right now that allows you to just sort of redo the movie on the fly. Yeah. And and you know, even refocusing it has been a, a area of a lot of research of being able to encode just enough information so that you could pull focus after Ooh, right. the compression instead right. of before the compression, right? Um, Man, that that requires one. all sorts of light field kind of thinking to, to be able to make that happen. But it all comes down to uh, different ways of compressing and decompressing, which is another way of saying different ways of optimized yeah. representation, which gets us into the symbolic representation, which yeah. is everything can be reduced to its simplest elements. But that's, again, back to the beginning where you lose context. If you only reduce things to their simplest elements and try to recreate something out of it, you wind up making a bland world. You might you wind up making something that's reusing the same parts everybody else is reusing, and it's missing the nuances of what did I mean or what did I say, just in the same exact way that set, saying something complicated in a text email is reducing it to a series of words that can be easily misinterpreted, right? We, 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 have, we leave ourselves open to all these misinterpretations by stripping out the details and the nuances to get to that optimized state. This makes me think about how you say that. It makes me think about something I've wondered about AIs, which is, if an AI doesn't have the con a context which, like us, is very specific, like you mentioned growing up in New York, right? And someone who's been lived in New York, you know, you and I can talk in a kind of shorthand about New York, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 it evokes, you know, I could say a subway entrance, right? And it it evokes like a lot of meaning, right? And and an AI uh, in conversation with you. 
uh, cannot do the same thing, or at least at this point in time, yeah. where we're doing inference and training in separated ways. You know, the, doing inference alone, I can't understand. Oh, this guy's from New York. I know what he means. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna say this one thing. You know, this one color, a smell, or whatever, and it's gonna mean a lot. I wonder if that also means that AIs are gonna be kind of uninteresting, kind of gray and yeah. neutral to us until such time as they can live among us in such a way that they can, you know, tune the conversation to be contextually relevant to mm -hmm. the person they're talking to. Yeah, I think that's totally true. I think that the that I don't have any problem with people using AI today to write things, to compose things. It's it's giving people a superpower for people who are not good at writing to write, for people who are not good at drawing to draw. But for the people who are really good at those things, it's a step backwards. It's it it is not anywhere near the level of skill and nuance they have because they're doing something that is in many ways new. Even though they're also doing the same thing that the computer did, which is they learned from a lot of past examples, they inputted everything else I ever read or saw, that goes into their process. They're also synthesizing something that in many ways is new and in many ways is more human uh, than, than what a computer can do. Even though I think the computer's doing really well with mixing and matching human inputs, it seems human because it's using so many human inputs to recompose something that also seems human, but it seems human in a way that we've all seen before, as opposed to uh, those few examples when you hit on them and you do a prompt and it just comes up with something amazing. You're like, no person ever would have come up with this. No human ever would have composed this because it's so weird in many ways. It's so it's so it's like a dream in a way that we're not we're not applying conscious skill, but it's almost like let the unconscious loose to do things. That's cool, and that's interesting, and it, it, it may, be, may be deserving of its own art form. Do, do you think, therefore, that we as humans are sort of innately creative, perhaps, in a way that AIs aren't? Is that what, what you mean, or at this moment, or something? I, I think that we are creative in a way that matters to other humans. I, I think uh -huh. that, that uh, the thing about art that's important yeah. is not the fidelity of the art, the colors of the art. What matters is what does it convey emotionally. So it's a, art is a form of communication right. from the artist to the audience, right? And if the audience is going to get what the artist meant, the artist had to have meant something. They may misread it. It may not be what the artist meant. That happens. But uh, but in general, is there's a form of sort of unspoken in, in, in many art forms, communication, yeah. that I'm supposed to be feeling something. When I see this this modern art on the wall, I'm, I'm yeah. getting some emotion from it. And if the artist was good, they probably designed that emotion. They probably intended right. for that emotion because what their skill is, is not just coming up with new things. They they may they may be like, um, I don't know, they, they may be, um, their art might've been totally random in the way they made it, but, yeah they know what's good and they they know here's the skill that i think that that matters is and, and i don't think the computers have this yet they can predict how a new audience person seeing it is going to feel uh, as they're building it and this is something i learned to do as a writer as uh -huh. i'm writing i need to be able to predict how my audience is going to perceive this in reading it later and as a coder i need to be able to predict how the computer is going to perceive this later and as a ui designer I need to predict how somebody is going to understand my UI later. So that ability to infer the human at the end of the process that I don't know, I don't know who it's mm -hmm. going to be, but I, I need to know how it's going to work. The computer doesn't have that yet. All it can do mm -hmm. so far is mix and match stuff it's already seen, right? right. And, and compose it maybe in a new way, but not in a way where it, it can understand how it's going to play for somebody. So that when you go on chat GPT and you say, but that's not quite right. It's like, oh, sorry, I know you're right. <laughs> Why didn't you know that before? If you, if I could tell you that it was wrong and you agree with me, how it, come you couldn't fix it? You it, didn't know. it feels of course, like a conversation with, with GPT is more like what human thinking is like, right? Albeit, you know, human thinking is like faster, right? Because we're constantly predicting, adjusting, predicting, adjusting, predicting, adjusting, right? Yeah. Which is what we're doing. And the, you're, yeah, the inference process of GPT can only take one thing and then generate one new thing, right? But you have to kind of reflect back on it so that you get really interesting. I've, I've been amazed by how like th there's that skill one develops in talking to AIs. And then when you show it to somebody for the first time to try to like show them how amazing it is or something like last year when everybody was showing people yeah. chat GPT for the first time, if they didn't know how to speak to it, they would get into this kind of rut. I always think of it as, right? That's just incredibly boring. You know, yeah. your mom turns to you and she's like, 
I don't know. I, you know, I asked it what the weather was like and it said it was sunny and I, it just kept talking about it being sunny and I'm bored. Exactly. But we would know, you know, how to like almost provide it with that external brain. Where you well, say, almost, this, almost like that. we're almost like it's, it's a, it's a precocious child and we're a teacher yeah. and we've had to learn the skill of how to get the output that we want yeah. from it. So we still have to be smarter than it in order to get, it'll save us time. If we don't want to have to write an email, I can write an email, but you have to be smart and on top of it to know if it's doing the right thing or not. Yeah. I, I want to, I want to take you back to just before second life, before you built the primitives at Linden, um, you had co-founded a, a company I think called Keyhole, mm -hmm. right? Which was later bought by Google and basically became Google earth. So like, how does, how does looking down on the whole world and trying to build like, you know, a rendering technique, if I remember that being the, one of the hardest parts for, yeah. for like a whole planet, you know, how do you compare like, r you know, thinking about rendering what 170 million square miles or whatever of earth, what did that give you in thinking about virtual worlds now? Uh, oh, good question. So I think um, the idea of, of the mirror world, right? The, 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 the twin of the real world, um, has been around for a long time. That was always one of the components of virtual worlds. There would be augmented reality, virtual reality, mirror worlds. So there's always sort of this axis of, right. of four. The, the fourth one everyone always forgets, and that's life logging. And that's that's sort of you know getting into people's lives and documenting, which we'll leave for another time. But but I, I was ve definitely interested in the mapping side of it. And it both of both virtual abstract virtual worlds and Earth have the challenge of um, of trying to convey a really complicated piece of information, which is the complexity of the planet, all the detail of the planet. Hmm. And right. the the virtual worlds where you're stuck on the ground most of the time, like Second Life, don't have the problem of necessarily zooming out. I mean, you'd like to. You want to see a map of all of Second Life to know where everything is and know which way to go. But to be able to understand the Earth in all its greater complexity, um, you need to really master the art of zooming. The zooming that the one of the most inspirational things hmm. for some of the founders of the company was the power of the powers of ten movie. Yes, from the seventies. Describe that. It's it, so wonderful. It's just yeah. amazing that the first you 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 where you, do they start out? It's you like start out at a picnic, I think. Right, it's a picnic, right? You it's zoom all the way out to space. You first you see that, you, but you, it starts from like human scale, right? Human so scale. it starts out at like the the hand or whatever. The, exactly. I remember the person's like there's a couple lying together, right? Yeah, and then they start and then they back. pull up, pull out, and then the Earth is a small dot, and you see the galaxy, and you see the, the the first the solar system, then the galaxy, yeah. and the, as much as we know about the universe, you yeah. see the picture. But then it reverses and zooms all the way back in and goes past and goes past the hand it, right? down to the subatomic, yeah. yeah. and to try to show you that as well. And it was done all with photographic techniques, no digital technology back then, right? It was amazing how they were able to produce this movie and actually put it together, which is photography. Yeah. So we did a similar thing digitally to be able to render the whole Earth. And the big challenge there was, um, and Chris Tanner is the one who solved probably the hardest bit was how on a conventional PC, which might have 16, 16 megabytes of memory, right? right for the like graphics that. card at yeah. best. How do you fit an entire planet in 16 megabytes yeah. where arguably the entire planet is going to take petabytes to store? Yeah. And how do you stream that? The part I worked on was how do you stream yeah. it over the internet? And that's where compression comes back in. You have to be able to compress and decompress that really efficiently. And the problem that Chris Tanner had solved was how do you manage the memory really efficiently? So you you're drawing a slice of the earth of whatever you can view, but you're only keeping the resolution that you need to, to make it happen. Because the, your, your image, your screen is only 1024 by 768 or something like that at the time. So you could, you could really figure out how many pixels you really need. You don't need more than that number of pixels, but the earth has many more number of pixels than that, right? Uh, by, by hundreds of orders of magnitude. So, so how do you get the right geometry, the right texture right. at the right time. That was the challenge that we solve. The part that I mostly worked on, aside from doing the initial streaming, was um, getting the user interface right. Because there are lots of uh -huh. virtual globes. There's NASA WorldWind. Microsoft had a 2D Explorer even back then. Uh, there's many other ways to do it. But it was getting the virtual globe to feel like a physical globe. Like, I'm putting my finger on this planet. And as I move my finger, it stays put. My finger stays on the exact spot that I that I touch. Ah. I hadn't seen anybody else do that before. And it just felt like the natural way to do it. I'm going to treat this like a classroom globe that I can spin in my hands. And I think that's one of the things that made it fun was that, that virtual tactility, even using a mouse on a screen, of feeling like this thing has some mass to it. I can throw it and it spins at a certain rate. And I can move around really fast. And then the other thing I think that was super 
um, impactful was how do I travel from, let's say, New York to Tokyo? Because there is an optimal path through the data set where you go, you go first you go up into space like a ballistic missile and then come right, back down. Right. Because you're taking that. the minimum data path through the database, but you also have to rotate the camera. So it was this really nice sort of felt like 2001 A Space Odyssey kind of a, yeah. a camera dance where you're looking at a spot and then you fly up into space and then back down and you zoom into your spot. And it just it felt it felt like ballet in some sense of the camera to be able to do that flight. And I think I think a lot of people appreciated that that just felt cool. It always did. And I, I know that I was influenced by that because I always wanted teleporting in Second Life to be like that, you know, yeah. like and I was never able to get to it. You know, and it's weird. Later on, we recapitulated some of the things that created the data set. Like if you remember, we would do the satellite overview and, you know, we would take all these satellite images. And then when you use the map and you zoom in on the map in Second Life, we would be doing that kind of, you know, a, a, a cheap version of yeah. what Google Earth does, you know, where we're panning around in that data set and then zooming in, as you say. But yeah, I always wanted the teleports to be physical in that regard, to be ballistic missile That would be cool. That would be right? super cool. And then you could see other people teleporting through by these arcs yeah, in space. Yeah, yeah, near you. Yeah, absolutely. That would have been I awesome. Thought it it turns somebody. out, yeah, the hard part is this streaming it efficiently because most, when you watch movies that do this, like this effect has been recreated a lot. Um, they normally skip the middle. <laughs> like they they yeah. they fly up into space and there's clouds and now they're in space and then they come back down again and there's yeah. clouds yeah. and then all of a sudden you're down at the ground level yeah. again. And to be able to do that continuously was the hard part. Uh, I think there's this mindset that you had because of that. And I had it too, where we both assumed that interesting things were comprised of much more data than you could look at all at once. I found when I was building Second Life that I would encounter people often from the game development world where they had a completely different mindset where they said, hey, and I guess this is kind of like a kind of neural compression too, right? They would say, hey, I just want to build a scene, you know, a mini golf thing. And then there's this just distant view of mountains around the mini golf place. But all the data, all the interesting stuff is like in this sphere mm -hmm. around this mini golf, you know, course or whatever. And I always found that mindset to be profoundly inconsistent with the mindset of I want to walk along the surface of the earth and yeah. explore a, you know, very sparse trajectory through petabytes of data. And like I've always thought about how that design aesthetic, if, if that's the right word, is just different between those two. It's things. totally different, but it, it'll converge ultimately. I think that. And this this top this exact topic comes up whenever people talk about the metaverse, right? Because if you're going to go try to build the metaverse, that is, when I what I mean by that, you always have to say what you mean now because there's so many yeah, different definitions of it. Mean? What I mean by that is the future of the web, which is a set of of ad hoc interconnected spaces that wasn't pre-designed with any world topology. So you could try to build a metaverse if there's such a thing. That is a, f a full world. Like imagine back in the day, GeoCities, right? There's a map. You pick your spot on the map and you build something. And very much like Second Life, there's a, there's a grid. Yeah. There's a map. That's that's the the Cartesian approach. Let's call it that that, that everything is connected in a very grid like way. But the way the web was built was much more like cells and portals, right? Links are like portals between web pages. I follow a link. I've yeah. I've gone through a tunnel and yeah. I come out somewhere else. And there's no geometric relationship. There's no Cartesian relationship between the web pages, which is why you needed search engines. You needed, you couldn't just build a map of the internet. You needed a semantic way of, of finding all those connections. And I think whatever the metaverse ultimately is, is gonna be more like that. And we can only build a map after the fact that we can't start with the design of neighborhoods and, and, and regions. And and with the, the reason I say that is because I think that because of the people that you've met who like to just build the golf course and not the world, people are going to be much more comfortable and it's going to be much safer for people. We've talked about safety a lot, safety right. of wearing glasses, yeah. but there's also the in-world safety of people and how they act towards each other, the kids and adults or adults when they're misbehaving or kids when they're misbehaving, all those things matter. And it's much safer to build what I what I like to call a consensual reality, which is this room is a consensual reality. Right. There's a whole world out there, but it's irrelevant to this room. It, the room is just what are you what are the what are the rules that you and I have agreed to? Right. We've agreed not to punch each other. We've agreed to remain closed. We've agreed not to curse. Like yeah. these are implicit assumptions, but we both agree to these same rules that that if we violated them, one of us would probably leave. And what you're saying is having a third person come in who didn't know those rules 
would sort of collapse the whole wave function. It, uh, it, even one person, even in a sea of a thousand people who, who have agreed to a consensual reality, one person coming in and disrupting it can make it really uncomfortable for everything. Consider Zoom bombing, right? right. People coming in and dropping their shorts on a, on a Zoom call yeah. to just make everybody else feel bad or time to penis and second life and all yeah. that stuff. It doesn't take a lot to make it to make it a non-consensual environment. And, and unfortunately, we have this legacy. All the technology we're dealing with came from the military, came from games, yeah. where the MO was killing people. The MO was, was admittedly abusive and intentionally yeah. so. And there's a whole bunch of people who think that's normal, that that's when you go into a virtual world of any kind, it's OK to abuse each other because that's the way games work. We beat up on each other. We fight each other. We kick each other. We shoot right. each other. And they don't understand that it's a whole new set of rules, that when you it's come also, into a social world. It's also that escapist idea, right? Games come from the idea of a restricted set of rules. As you say, they're often combative, right? There's some sort of a uh, zero-sum game or right. something And that's like okay that. for those games. Right, that's how right. they're designed, right? And they're also escapist, right? I've always found that, that like the idea of a game as a relaxing simplification of the world that you live in because it's the end of the day and you just like to sit down and make it all easier than what you just went through the rest of the day. Yeah. That's like, I've always thought of as being like a big part of what game means. But the problem I think for people interacting with each other is that if you also escape, uh, if you also throw away the social contract or the norms of behavior that we were just mentioning, yeah. then you run into this problem that you can't do that game thing with other people, particularly ones you don't know, and have it all work. If you set up the rules, you can though, because if you had a big connected world and you said, when you come into this space, it's a mosh pit. When you come into this other space, we can shoot each other. Mm -hmm. As long as there's a sign on the door that says, these are the right. rules, and if you enter this space, you're agreeing to these rules, it is manageable. We do that in the real world. We have mosh pits, we have, we have paintball arenas, but we don't let people run around the street shooting paintballs at each other. And we don't let people bounce off each other on the street because we didn't agree, we didn't agree to those rules in the commons. And that's what I mean by consensual reality is first start with the set of rules that we agree yeah. to in a small space. And then whenever it's safe, link it up to other spaces. But the doorways, the portals should always have the disclaimer on them saying, here's what you're going to get when you go through this portal. Did, related, is there one metaverse or many metaverses? Obviously, that's one of these distinctions around what does the word mean metaverse that we're talking about. So when yeah. you think about connected worlds and consensual spaces, does that mean there's it's one thing or is it many things or is there like a, a gradient? Is the web one web page? Right. It's not. It, no. And it's not even one browser, right? There are multiple browsers multi, looking at multiple web pages that just happen yeah. to connect to each other. But there is one internet, right? The people can splinter the there internet. There are links between those pages, right? There, that does there, make it some. But it's the same one. distinction. I think I think what we're going to ultimately, if we, I don't even think we're going to use the word metaverse. Apologies to Neil Stevenson. I think that it's been abused so much at this point that, that just like cyberspace had been in the 90s, I think that by the time this stuff is really mainstream, <laughs> we will call it something else. And I'm right now I put my bets on spatial computing, but there could be yet another word after that. You heard it here first. It could be that metaverse is the new cyberspace, oh, right? Totally. <laughs> like just because Facebook bought it. Like if they don't if Facebook yeah. doesn't succeed, metaverse as a word is dead. Right. Only if Facebook succeeds can that word can that word succeed. Because no one else is going to want to call it that if it's associated with something that's bad. So they're going to have a whole new word that means the same thing, just like yeah. cyberspace did. Yeah, yeah. So so this is Facebook bought it and now they own it and and it's up to them whether that word succeeds. But whatever whatever the word is, whatever yeah. it's called, the concept of a next generation spatially embodied internet will happen one way or another. And and the question is, there's something that's going to be the analog of the internet. It may just still be the internet. We just call the internet the internet, yeah. and we don't have to call it the metaverse. And these these things which have traditionally been called virtual worlds are like web pages. They're like they're like thoughts, single single areas that have multiple rooms and places to go, and then they're arbitrarily connected. Now, the web of all those things, what do you call them? I don't know. Um, I like to joke that for the AR side of things, I like to call it the worldwide world, that you have this connected yeah. link of world-based things, but that doesn't work for the purely, purely virtual it one. It feels like there's almost a continuum between, or there's a, there's a, there's a bunch of points in between like complete spatial contiguity like Second Life had, right? Where, as you said, it is literally one world yeah. where every object in Second Life on a good day can be moved from any point in the world to any other point in the world, and it'll still do exactly what that object did, right? To what you said, like the, 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 the other example would be the web, where you have web pages that are 
very rich, right? And then they're connected by these tiny, tiny threads. Yeah, they which want are that because they want to keep you. They, yeah. Don't, they, yeah. like if if think about. It, I'm sure we saw, we saw this in Second Life that if somebody was creating a destination in Second Life, they didn't want a million exits. <laughs> they wanted they wanted an entrance. And 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 right. stuff to keep you there, right. but having making it easy for people to leave was not a priority for the people making <laughs> the content. So I think it's the same with web pages that you minimize the links and you're careful about the links that you choose. And and this came up a lot. Like I helped um, I helped Lamina One with their white paper, and Tony right, Parisi is, right. is a friend of mine, and, yeah. and we talk about this stuff all the time. And and the take that we had, we had to deal with the fact that Neil Stevenson, you know, the head of the company, the founder mm -hmm. of the company, had very much said. The metaverse is defined as everyone sees the same stuff in the same place at the same time. That sounds very Cartesian. Mm -hmm. in, and I think he probably imagines it that way based on the book as this big connected space that you yeah. take this transit line to go back and forth. I was going to say, even Snow Crash, he almost almost simplified it to a one-dimensional it, it was practically one-dimensional, kind yeah. of like the line in, in yeah, Saudi Arabia, right? Yeah, the street. Um, and, and, um, and, and maybe that's a good way to go, maybe not. But I think that I don't think it's going to be Cartesian. So the 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 um, compromise that we came up with, what made sense was that any two people standing in the same place will see the same thing. It's not like I see blue and you see red right. in the same place. But because of the fact that there's a portal here and that portal might make take me to a place which is not Cartesian connected in the same way that it would be if it were literally adjacent, I can make a hole in this wall and be in London that you can't draw that map. It winds up looking yeah. like a subway map at the end of the day, not a, not a regular Cartesian map. Um, that as long as that's consistent, then people will see the same thing in the same place at the same time. Because if you go through the same portal I go through, you wind up in the same place I wind up. But that's not always true. There have to be permissions. I might not have paid the dollar I need to pay to go through that portal, yeah. or I might be 13 and too young to go through that portal. So there, not everybody has to take the same route to get to the same place. Yeah. So somebody might take a route that's 10 times longer than someone else because they were able to pay for a shortcut or have some ability to run. And I, and I think, let me bring it, but bring that together and then ask you another question. I think that it is so incredibly important that we make these design decisions with this thought of, does it cause humans to feel contextually connected in yeah. the right way, right? Like yeah. it, it's all about that, yeah. I think. And then so saying that, and then, you know, so whether there's one metaverse or many, or, you know, whether it's threads or portals, I think it matters because do we feel connected to each other? Do we feel an ability to establish common ground there like we do here? Take a step quickly. back from that. Do they even feel like it's too confusing, right? Right, if, right. If, if I, like, yeah. you could imagine being in a kind of a haunted house that was, every room was a portal to another room, but it made no sense, no sense in a Cartesian map. Yeah. You would get lost. And there's movies yeah. about this. There's yeah. there's right. movies about people getting lost in mazes of yeah, cubes like cells and or, cells yeah, and they, they right. that, and there's games actually that are built around these ideas too. If if the space is not consistent, if it constantly changes like it does in the, in some of the cube movies, and things get rearranged, all bets are off. People get yeah. really confused, and it makes trust is lost too, yeah, right? Trust exactly. is lost too. So going off of that, do you think that? And let's talk about grown-ups rather than kids, because we already touched a little bit on kids. Yeah. And I agree with you, by the way, that we should treat virtual worlds as identical to the real world with respect to keeping kids safe. Yeah. Make no assumption that the world is going to keep your kids yeah. safe in any way exactly. that the real world would. Wouldn't, and, and it's you know. not even like video games where you, where you might be okay with your kid playing Call of Duty on the TV screen. If it's a virtual world, if they're you immersed in it, it yeah. will create PTSD. It will change their brain oh, because it's so right, much right. more immersive. And I'm thinking also in virtual worlds, you might not be able to see what they're doing where as, as someone else who has kids, yeah. um, you know, on screens, you can just set the kid in front the, of the, the screen. The parents and need to be them. there with the kid. <laughs> yeah. That's, a th that's yeah. the bottom line is, is be a chaperone. And, but, but switch yeah. to grownups. Yeah. yeah. So the question is, can we establish common ground and become friends and establish trust and be good to each other and generally get along in virtual worlds? Yes or no? And if yes, how? I think yes, but I think it's going to take a little more evolution of us. Like I think that of us or of the technology? Both, but but of us, most importantly. So ah. I think if you were just to take people as they are today and plop them into a world in which everybody has superpowers, they would kill each other. That the, this, is the, this is the problem that we see with guns in the real world and with violence in the real world is that some people should not have power or dominion over other people in any way because right. they're, they're, they're not mature enough to restrain themselves and to restrain their animal responses. And so those people are, are just not, you know, 
in control of their emotions or evolved enough yet, and and they become dangerous when given power. Somebody right. who who is not mature enough to use a gun should not have a gun, right? right? And that's just that's just if you if you don't obey that rule, people get shot. And the it, the equivalent thing happens in virtual worlds that if you give people the power to manipulate the world beyond the physical constraints that we all have in the real world, all of a sudden you have godlike powers in a virtual world. When, whenever somebody gets pissed at somebody else, you have the equivalent of road rage. And if people aren't thinking, they're going to hurt each other. And so mm -hmm. in addition to the technology evolving better tools, I think fundamentally, and one of those one of those five hero principles is that technology can never solve that problem. Mm -hmm. that, that people will always find a way to subvert whatever nanny system you build that is attempting to make people behave well. If somebody is not behaving well, you've got to pull them out. You've got to retrain them to behave well. The system can't enforce that. You can kick them out potentially, but like like all the, the controls that, that Horizons have done with enforcing bubble zones, all these tools that we try to impose on people, yeah, yeah. to the extent that they work, they make the world more authoritarian and less fun and less open-ended, right. and they mostly don't work. Uh, they mostly, there's not nothing a bubble is going to do is going to solve people from from making rude gestures to each other yeah. or or pretending to, to sexually Elaborate on what a bubble is, by the way, for people who haven't heard that, because I think it is an important so point. So personal space, too. different cultures have different ideas of personal space. You yeah. can get, if you go to Japan, you can get crowded on a train and there's no personal space whatsoever. But in the US, we have a lot more of it. Yeah. And if you invade someone's personal space, you can, just by your proximity, can make them very uncomfortable. Right. And this it's is kind of that arm's length. It's kind of arm's length. Two, we're two we're feet, right now yeah, at, right a, at almost exactly our perfect bubbles distance. are just touching. Are just middle touching of the table. so yeah. that we can converse. Yeah. Uh, anything closer would would have to be intimate, and that you know that we both and have. By to the agree way, to farther that. away wouldn't feel good either. Far, which exactly. Is why right. people sit right at the distance we are right now. Exactly. It, it is cultural, but but also in in these virtual worlds, if somebody wants to be aggressive, they will invade your space, and they right. will they will they don't have to physically grab you to make you feel uncomfortable whether you're a man or a woman doesn't matter people can be harassed i was harassed in second life way back when and it, it affected me i didn't want to be what happened it, i think i was just in the in the newbie island where you first come on and somebody was hanging out there and being a jerk and i was like i i felt so powerless to stop it i had no tools and and yeah. that that was a big factor for me of 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 you know whether or not i wanted to spend time in the space was how much how much power i had to protect myself don't you think a big piece of it though is how these worlds are structured with respect to the consequences of your actions you mentioned you know facebook being like the nanny state and i think one of the important distinctions is there's a big difference between so 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 there's this idea that anything i can do will at most result in facebook being unhappy with me right, right. That strikes me as a very, very different and authoritarian and unhealthy social construct. Like, no matter what I do to Avi, nothing will matter except what this other person over here might do to me later. Yeah. Right. Also, uh, and and, that feels uh, just unless I violate someone's copyright, then they do care. Um, but <laughs> right. yeah, I mean, that's this is where I first, you know, formed an early opinion of Facebook was around 2008. Somebody had had taken my photo, and 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 Microsoft had put out a press release when I joined, so they knew they knew who I was from the press release. They took my photo, opened the Facebook account because I never had, and they. The worst part was they invited all, almost everybody at Microsoft to be their friend, and probably it was a it was either a, um, a phishing attack or corporate espionage. Who knows what? But I told Facebook. My, my wife found it. I told wow. Facebook about it, and they wouldn't take it down. I'm like, why not? I, it's clearly my picture and my name. You know, it's not that they're not wow. another duplicate of me, and the only thing they responded to was the fact that I had copyright on the photo. And they the only that they respected. Action you could take the only was action. There was nothing yeah. else they would do about it. And it's very similar today. Only things that they're actually liable for are the things they care about. Wow. So you can't piss them off even by anything you do unless it's something that'll get them in trouble with with a regulator or or or, or, or a police force somewhere. But with the right consequences imposed, and I personally think those consequences are more person to person. You know, if I make you angry or your friends angry, there could be consequences for that, just like there are in the real world. Yeah. Um, with those right consequences, though, you said that you think the answer is yes, we can. We That's can why I like along. the consensual reality, because the, the most most often we're going to be interacting with the groups of people we already know. So having 
having a 3D spatial bubble that contains the people I already know. Yeah, yeah. It, might, it might include my crazy uncle that comes to Thanksgiving who I don't like uh, or the person who voted for Donald Trump or whatever. Like those people might be in my circle, but I know how to deal with those people. Like that's a normal thing that we already deal with. Right. It doesn't include the the griefer, the person who's going to try to harass me, an unknown person who thinks they can get away with it. Mm -hmm. So those those the the consensual reality is just inherently safer. How does the griefer gain your trust so that you will let them come to the next? Well, party? this is the one of the debates we've been having, you know, with 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 the new stuff uh, you're doing, yeah. and that's that is how do you approve new people? People can pretend yeah. they could be the you know the the wolf in sheep's clothing and pretend yeah. to be good and yeah. then act evil later. I think the accountability probably has to be on people who let them in in addition yeah. to how they behave. So I was essentially vouching for you by letting you in. Yeah. And if you misbehave, yeah. it's on me. Yeah. Yeah. Some some amount of that is on me. And if yeah. I if I let a bunch of bad people in, I'm out. Yeah. And and that needs to mean something too. There needs to be a cost of being out. And I don't know, Ralph Koster's right. talked a lot about this. The the more equity you bring you build in yeah. the world in terms of your history and your stuff, the more you have to lose. But if you're just coming in fresh and you know you want to be a griefer and not collect anything and yeah. not have any equity, there's you got nothing to lose except you know, maybe they, they flag your credit card and now you can't get in again. I think there's a really strong pattern. Of course, you were talking about one of the experiments I've been working on, which is called Fair Share, where one of the deals with it, it's a, it's an, you know, it's an experiment in economic systems. Yeah. But one of the deals is you have to get admitted to a group and that group can let you in or they can kick you out, which is what you're referring to. I think there's a general pattern around making virtual worlds and making Internet societies work where you define groups and you allow those groups to have fairly strong boundaries, but you encourage people to belong to multiple groups. Yeah. And then those groups can interact at the level of trust. I can say, well, Avi belongs to the XR Guild or Avi created the XR Guild. I'm going to, I trust anyone who's in the XR Guild to come to my party. Right. Um, and that seems like, a, I, I think that's a very reasonable pattern that unfortunately has been underused for different reasons by the industry. Like you were mentioning Facebook, I think in that case, they're just trying to maximize views. And since griefing in some ways sometimes maximizes views, they just don't care. And then you had to, I think it's really interesting what you said, you had to resort to a legal recourse, which is a copyright violation, which kind of is bigger than the internet, weirdly, right. Right. Uh, you know, because of the DMCA and, you know, the Communications Act. So that's fascinating. Yeah, it, it's it's totally right. I, th I think the belonging to multiple groups is, is great because it's kind of like, um, for me, it, it, the analogy is college, university. Uh, I first went to a small school. It was only a thousand people, but then I went to Ohio State, which was like 50,000. Oh. And there were so many overlapping communities, even different parts of campus had different communities. And it allows you to not always have to be the same thing to everybody. You can show different sides of yourself, but it also allows you to compare. So if people are really misbehaving over in this world because they didn't set enough rules and in this other space, it's much better because, you know, uh, because it's a neighborhood and people know each other mm. and they care about it. You can spend more, more of your time in the one that's working for you. And if you happen to be somebody who likes to get into a lot of fights, you'll find groups of people who like that as well. So people can gravitate to the sets of rules that they they like. And I think as you remember, Second Life had a lot of experimentation like that yeah. where, you know, the Jesse Wall and, you know, I, I, I just had Wagner James out uh, do a podcast here and where, you know, he was one who documented a lot of the wars in the very early days of Second Life. But there were these very different, um, as you said, there were very different contextual rules about behavior in different communities. Yeah. Um, it's fascinating. Uh, I think we'll come back to that at the very end, but, but Let's switch topics a little bit and talk about uh, VR headsets. And yeah. uh, you've 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 done some work. Uh, well, you my gosh, you've done work on everything. The most the latest thing that everybody's talking about is the Vision Pro. I guess what I would ask you is, what does that tell us about the future? Uh, what do you like about it? Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, that's a big topic. And and uh, so I think for context, I I've spent. Yeah. The last, um, I don't know, since 2010, however many years, um, learning about hardware. Like I was always much more of a systems and software person and not thinking about hardware. And then I had to learn a lot about it in trying to get big companies like Microsoft. You know, I worked on the HoloLens early on 2010 for the first right. year of its life, most of that year anyway. Um, and 
it's all it's it's for me it's about the experiences like the work that i do is all about figuring out what are the right user experiences to justify the hardware why don't build it and hope that you'll find the experiences later first figure right. out the experiences and then build the hardware that supports those experiences that's always the best way to do it everybody who starts with the platform first i think fails um so so those things started that way it doesn't mean they're always going to turn out right but but at least we had a pretty crisp idea of what it was for right. when it first started and that's the first question to ask is not so much what what's better optical pass through versus video right. pass through. Um, I could argue I could spend an hour telling you the technical debate as to when, when you choose one or the other. I think what's great now is that we have a choice. Somebody can choose like, you know, with Magic Leap to have a totally transparent headset yeah. that solves the occlusion problem one way. You have to solve the occlusion problem one way or another. Uh, and, and then Apple can do it a totally other way. And those two things are different and they're better for different experiences. So the, ultimately it comes down to what are you trying to do? What are you trying to get done? What is it your work? Is it your socializing? Are you trying to do human to human communication? Right, right. And then you pick the technology that's going to be the best for that. As an example, let's say we wanted to optimize and you have know, talked a lot about this, but, 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 but I think it'll be interesting. Uh, let's say we wanted to optimize for this face to face communication. Right. Right. I think that we know the limits of avatars. We're no, no one yet you know, has totally photorealistic avatars that will fool your spouse and, yep. and, and not look different in some way. They all look different than reality. And, and by the way, I don't call it the uncanny valley. I call it the uncanny mountain because the closer you get, the worse it is. Actually, in right. many ways, the easier it is to slide all the way back down that slope when you make one mistake, <laughs> right? Kind of so it's not just a, a gap you have to jump. It, yeah. It's it's it's, yeah. it's asymptotic, and we know we yeah. we know that we're on the other side of the asymptote, but we've never gotten there through the computers yet. So yeah. avatars are hard, and and the people who work on them have to work really hard to make them as good as as they've made them. So so I take the, the take of what's easier. Like let's just think of an easier way. And I, and I yeah. started doing this in, in 2009. Just started making 3D video. So if you had a 3D camera filming you, call it light field or call it depth cameras with color, whatever, right. and I had one filming me, then we could, if we had the right display devices, see each other in 3D as much more of a video than as an avatar, right? Yep. It's it's there's no geometry involved. There's no there's no skeletons and no shaders. It's just literally video, but with yeah. depth. So I've done a lot of experimentation with that. The problem is what headset would you use if you were going to yeah. try to capture someone's face? Capture that, yeah. Right? You could yeah. go the Apple way, which is totally valid. You have an occluding headset, so you need dozens of cameras to capture your body and try to simulate what you look like. Or you could just try to capture it directly. If you're going to go that route, I would argue you need very thin transparent glasses. So you need something where if yeah. I'm wearing the magic glasses that let me see you, I can also you can see also you see perfectly. me perfectly yeah. exactly yeah. my eyes the light goes right through yeah. and and it's, it's not dim it's not dark yeah. and it's not occluding so I think the world is going to come down to those two choices in in for optimizing for face to face communication which has a very similar to should we be life, optimizing for face to face I think that's one of the most important use cases I do that, too. You, that 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 not everybody can do I think that avatars are great for collaboration though. So if you and yeah. I were both working on a shared document, even a 3D document, we don't need to look at each other all the time. Right. And the nonverbal cues are a little less important. They're important and they're important that when I go that, you know what I'm pointing at. Pointing. So the, yeah. eye, the eyes and the fingers and all that stuff is important to get right. But do you have to know that I'm subtly disappointed? Like you may hear it in my voice, but do you have yeah. to see it in my face? It's less important in in work environments than it is. It would be important if if you were my CEO and I work for you and we're having a conversation about salary or the future, or you're giving me my yearly feedback, then the communication matters a lot. But, but, but going back to what you said, I, I think you made an important point, which is I too was struck by when I saw the Vision Pro get announced, there were so many fascinating things to look at and so many cases where you figured, I still haven't put one on my head, but I figured you know, there's gonna be lots of new things that Apple is gonna show us with this piece of hardware, but the thing that I really noticed was the absence of a lot of demonstration of live communication in yeah. the initial presentations that were made, which made me very concerned because it felt to me like without doing something around communication, it would be difficult to get to that kind of transformative new computing experience, which Apple has so often in the past given us. Yeah. And, and I think in this case, I'd ask you, the question is, what is the Vision Pro? What is it for? The, the, well, there's... 
I'll give you two answers. I'll answer the second part later. But the, the, the most basic one is, and again, I don't speak for Apple and I also can't disclose anything that is still right. private uh, to the extent yeah. I know it. But <laughs> but I, I have to be careful about saying things about the future. But what I think is really clear about what they've said and, and about the product that they put out is it is very much the same kind of a shift as when the Macintosh came out, right? So you had this Xerox Park GUI interface that came from 1968, the, the mother of all demos. The same right. year, Ivan Sutherland did the first AR demo, the first 2D mouse right. and Windows demo did. That was much easier to build. The 2D windows and mice dominated, have dominated since 1968 till now because it was just an easy, simple interface yeah. that everybody could get, especially with a one button mouse, yeah. which was a trick to making it so that you can't fail with the mouse, right? It, it sort of makes it, it huh. makes it so that anybody can move Which things on a Jobs desktop. Love the single button mouse. It was, yeah. it was super important for new people. It didn't yeah. matter so much for experts. They could use a two or three button mouse, but new people needed a one button mouse. And, and what this product is, is the analogy of the Macintosh for spatial computing. It's the yeah. first device, not that nobody's tried spatial computing before. Again, Magic Leap used the term and, and, and took a run up this hill and got part of the way up. Yeah. But I think that, uh, and, and what it is is really good for a lot of certain applications. But 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 what what Apple's throwing down the gauntlet with is saying this is the next user interface paradigm, and it's the one that's going to displace the mouse and the and the windows. Even though the first thing they're showing you are two D windows, yeah. that's a bridge. Yeah. They they instantly have thousands of applications that run on iOS and I, iPad OS that run on on Apple Vision Pro. So you're not starting from scratch. But I don't think anybody expects everybody to stick in 2D windows. It's not just about having more screen real estate, it's about having the content come off the screens. And so a lot of their toolkits that they've shown make it easy for you to pop stuff out of 2D into 3D, including personas, avatars. Yeah. And that's gonna be transformative, even if the avatars are not yet totally photorealistic. Again, the, the, the photorealistic ones, that's what you need for the I'm sitting down with my mother and virtually having coffee yeah. because I want to have all the interpersonal stuff that we would get. But for doing work together, for being able to play games together, for collaboration, uh, or for normal everyday communications that are not intimate, I think the level of, of persona yeah. and avatar they have is, is sufficient that you'll see apps come out that are going to be better ways to meet, better ways to, to interact with people. And if anything, the big failing of the whole industry is not in the fidelity, it's in the fact that we are forcing people to be synchronous all the time. This is the problem with Zoom meetings, it's the problem with virtual worlds, is that we're too busy. We have so many things to do that we're not always synchronous. We need to be solving mm -hmm. asynchronicity, but that's not an Apple problem. That's yeah. everybody yeah. still has trouble grasping Information dieting that. problem. Yeah. You, but you, you make a good comparison that's great to go back to Ivan Sutherland and Xerox Park's idea of a mouse controlling Windows, right? That was actually, I don't know, maybe Maybe uh, hindsight makes it seem clearer, but that was a pretty obvious, cool idea, right? We all, you grew up with this like me, we grew up in that first era of text interfaces, you know, where we were using DOS and we were using uh, uh, Unix maybe, and we were mostly doing things with text. And then the, there was some moment at which we all saw for the first time, whether it was the Macintosh or it was Windows, right? We saw a windowed operating system and a mouse that could drag windows around, right? I'm wondering like for the Vision Pro, because I don't think it's there yet. You know, what is the equivalent like, oh my God, that's just so new and so easy. And so I can apply that to everything as an interface scheme. Yeah, I don't quite see it, but I do feel at least in retrospect that I saw it with the mouse and windows. Yeah, I, I think in terms of like, what are those applications? I, th I think that I think that what we would see, so, so I'm also an advisor for a company called Campfire that is essentially making something that like like what would Keynote look like or what would PowerPoint look like in the sense of not that it, it's a generic tool that can do anything. But in this case, if, if you were trying to use a tool that would let you tell stories about 3D products, right? Uh -huh. Spatial products need a spatial storytelling tool hmm. because they're inherently 3D. Every time you reduce it to a 2D storytelling tool, you're losing a lot of important information. So by being able to have the experience of the sneaker or the jet engine or whatever it is you're designing in 3D, you can you can build design reviews and presentations yeah. and storytelling in a much more natural way and everybody can walk around it the way we used to walk around cardboard models or cars made out of clay 
to be able to understand it. So you're mm -hmm. getting all those benefits. And that's something that isn't new with Apple Vision Pro, but it's going to be better on that yeah. than it's been on almost anything except maybe Avario. That you saw these high-end applications, yeah. and that costs twice as much, right? Yeah. Um, as as the Apple did. If people are uh, are concerned there, about the price, is there anything in particular you can point to without having the Apple people in the distance hit the button and you know freeze you? Yeah. Um, you know, can you say anything about like specifically w what you worked on at all? Or sure, sure. And then actually, you know, my my LinkedIn is is fairly explicit on this. I think um, what my official title was senior manager in charge of experience prototyping. And so mm. uh, very similar to what I did at Microsoft and at Amazon as well, is that whenever you start a new project, before it's even been approved, you need to build the demos that show you what it's going to be like. Yeah. And some of those demos are hardware demos that I don't do. I don't build hardware demos. I use, my teams use whatever we can get off the shelf existing things and we put them together in new ways yeah. in order to tell the story, the exact same story about the sneakers or the jet engine, but the exact same story about the product, about what is this product going to be? How are people going to use it? And all the decision makers would do way better experiencing it and seeing how they feel and trying to project it to cut into customers of the future. Like that, the job of an executive or a designer is to have enough intuition to know before you build the product, is it going to work or not? Right. Yeah. If they don't, if they can't do that well, they're not going to be, probably be a good designer or executive. So they're in that position because they've made good decisions in the past about existing products. Now they're faced with a whole new one, and we don't know if it's going to be good. Are we going to spend billions of dollars on something and have it be a flop? That would be terrible. That could sink a company. So you want to build as much of it as cheaply as possible, in a way that is compelling and gives you a sense of what it's really going to be like without spending a billion dollars. And that's my job. That's the job is to. In, in, in Apple was to manage a team. I didn't write code in this case, yeah. but in other jobs, I wrote, I did more coding. And the 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 secret sauce is the one trick that I'll tell people is, is the most important thing that I can tell you and people still don't do it. The most important part of the job is listening yeah. is because when you start a project like that, everybody's going to have their doubts. Everybody's going to have their concerns. And so one of those kinds of concerns is, is VR socially isolating? You got to listen for that concern Right. And then build a demo that proves that it, it doesn't have to be. That it can be if you do it wrong, but if you do it right, VR or XR or AR can be a positive social in, uh, factor. And so the demo that you want to build isn't just, hey, I made this cool demo, check it out. It's this demo answers the exact dilemma that's keeping you up at night and getting you to stop from approving this project. Huh. And so by seeing that demo and go and, and you come out of that demo thinking, yeah. oh, no way will I ever put this thing on my face. You come out of the demo going, we have to build this. Yeah, That's the kind of demo that makes a project so like, like that happen. So like a demo, maybe you work on a demo that reduces that sense of social isolation. So flipping that around, like when you think about things getting to a billion people, right? Like there's very few things that are technology mediated that we have done at that scale as yet, right? Like if you look at Facebook, it would be like posting pictures about stuff you did. I guess that would be Facebook and Instagram, right? If yeah. you... Uh, if you look at TikTok, it would be consuming uh, video, right? I guess an equivalent question would be when a billion people are actually making use of um, some kind of VR, AR device every day. What one, how long do you think that'll take? You know, classic question. And then two, why? What's what's the thing that we're all doing with those devices? A billion of us yeah. every day. Yeah. That's equivalent to like what we started doing with Facebook. Yeah, it's actually the answer to that question is different than the answer to what did I do? Because the job of the prototypers is to figure out the first 10 experiences, right? Maybe only three, right? That the jobs didn't get up on stage and sell the iPhone with 100 apps. Right. He sold it with three core experiences, maybe 10 that that ships with, right? Thousand thousand songs in your pocket, internet browsing, phone calls. Yeah. Um do people use it for phone calls today? Not as much. I was going to say, right? I think internet browsing was really the fundamental transformation. That, that probably thing. was. Yeah, from, then, from the previous. And then it was augmented by apps. Exactly, exactly. Um, and the thing that they had to overcome was not everybody, but enough people said, I need a keyboard because a BlackBerry, et cetera. Yeah. They had to prove that that wasn't going to be a deficit, that the, that the capacitive touch keyboard was going to be as good or better than than the physical keyboard. I can remember as a very busy executive at the time that the iPhone came out, um, I was just utterly. I thought it was laughable yeah. that it was a glass screen yeah. for typing. Yeah, I was but, just like, but now you do it laughable. all the time, right? Yeah. So 
so that was that was one of those hurdles to overcome. So so my team would be like the one to show you how to overcome the hurdle. And then the first three applications, we would think a lot about what those are. But then once you open it up and you get past 10 million people, 100 million people, and you have a developer ecosystem, I could predict maybe what some of those killer apps will be at that point. I don't even like the word killer app because that there's never just one. Like, but like what? The, yeah. The killer app of the phone is the is the store. <laughs> like actually, that's the killer app. The killer app is the fact that it's not limited. It's the fact that anybody can write an app to go on the phone and extend its functionality to do everything. That uh -huh. that wasn't a feature of the version one, right? The right. store didn't yeah, exist store until two or three years yeah. later. So, so I think when you get to a, a billion people, the answer is we don't know. Like we could guess, I'm going to guess that it's communication. The thing that everybody yep. is going to want to do, a billion people already communicate today a lot. You're going to need a replacement for the communication they do today on that device. And what you don't want is for people to use their iPhone and text each other, hey, you want to go into, into XR right, together? Right, right. You want to jump into spatial computing? There needs to be a way yeah. for us to already have our headsets on and to go, hey, Philip, let's jump in and let's have a conversation. So some new way of communicating. Some new I way of communicating. I couldn't agree with you more. Synchronous, asynchronous yeah. matter. I think we need to figure out how to replace texting with something that's spatially embodied. Yeah. And those things are not figured out yet, as far yeah, as I can tell. That's going to take a while, no, right? That's going to take a while, and it's going to evolve. And that's where the next you know, Facebook, Twitter, or whatever are going to come in, but not tomorrow because yeah. you need also to have yeah. 100 million consumers out there ready to, ready to yeah. jump with them. I think bringing it all back or you know, tying it all together, like it's about communication. And then beyond that, and I think we've both been very passionate and worked on this in different ways, in overlapping ways, is it has to be communication and it has to be the right kind of communication that causes us to you know, increase trust, you know, yeah. enjoy each other more, yeah. not less, and enjoy, I think, more people more or you know, b build relationships that we perhaps yeah bring have. bring people closer. The the thing that yeah. people need the most that I think that texting doesn't give us, yeah. and a lot of the social network doesn't give us, is everybody needs to be loved. And so, yeah. if you build socially yeah. isolating communication that strips us from that feeling of of, of loving and caring for each other, mm -hmm. that's antisocial. It's a great but way it, of putting it. If so, so I really it does pain me when I see two teenagers in a room texting each other, and they're in the same <laughs> room. And they're not talking to each other. They're, they're not, texting each other. They don't have even the potential for exchanging love in some and, sense. And, right? and I know, I know a few really smart yeah. people who say yeah. that's the future. Yeah. That's, but I, I think that's a phase that they're yeah. stuck with technology that's not fulfilling. And right. I think they will be happy to replace that yeah. with something better when it comes along. Yeah, it feels like everyone younger right now has the agility and the skill and the motivation to find that love in, in the technology, but we are definitely not there yet. Yeah. Like they are struggling, you know, you can, younger people, you can see them looking at these phones, I think sometimes and just being like, I can't believe you guys stuck us with this miserable thing. You yeah. know, now we've got to figure out how to move beyond it. Exactly. Um, Pop, you know, pulling the camera all the way back from the beginning of the conversation. Um, as you know, I, I'm really, as we build all this crazy technology, so say AI, VR, electric cars, whatever, um, I'm struck by the need for us all to have a common social contract around our behavior, right? Like, I think that I've said, I've talked about this a lot lately, that I think software engineering doesn't have its like Hippocratic oath. Although yeah. as a side note, star, star, the, Hippoc the original Hippocratic oath is kind of dumb. Um, but the general idea that doctors... It's been improved since then. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's been improved. And doctors and mechanical engineers... For example, civil engineers, civil engineers, even lawyers, have very real, even lawyers, right? right? Have very even different lawyers. sense of ethics, yeah. but they have ethics, but they have very real lines they won't cross. And it's not because of the law or because of the company they work for. Right. Yeah. There are lines they won't cross. Right. Yeah. So the question I'd ask you as somebody who's had a ton of experience and has done a lot of it work, both in hardware and software, what are the rules that you would, you know, what's the social contract we need to have as engineers as we build these insane things like ai yeah i think that i mean there's been some progress on the on the ai ethics front there's certainly a lot of people talking about it and thinking about it um it can't be boiled down to asimov's three rules of robotics unfortunately that's not right. implementable but um for the people building the ai and the people evaluating those systems i think something more like you know 10 or 15 rules might yeah. suffice to be able to say, here's the right way to do it. Here's what we've learned from experience is the wrong way to do it. Right. For spatial computing in XR, that's what we have at the XR Guild. So our, our, we didn't do this comprehensively. Like we didn't, 
I, I still am not convinced that there's one set of ethic rules for all of computer science that will work. And if, uh -huh. the, if there are, they'll be so general that they're easy to defeat, right? If, if I were to simply right, say, right, right. don't harm people, yeah, don't, like, you know, don't like, be evil. What does it mean? I mean, yeah. I don't think the, the ad tech companies don't wouldn't say they're harming people. They think they're yeah. doing a benefit by giving you a targeted ad, but I would disagree. Yeah. And I can explain yeah. why they're not benefiting people, yeah. but they would disagree with me. So um, the, the, the goal so there's is- there's rooms in which there are perhaps different social contracts for the, engineers. So, so I would be perfectly happy if a, if a company that was in ad tech would at least be really clear about their principles, like even mm -hmm. if they were different from mine, so that we can analyze them and not just pretend that they're all yeah. the same. So I, I think the world is one in which we have multiple sets of ethical principles. Yeah. And we developed a set that works for a number of people working in spatial computing that says, this is a pretty good set of principles. If I think about this in my design decisions daily as I code or build or PM a project, um, it's, it's kind of like the constitution in the sense that whenever there's ambiguity, I can go back and look at the principles and say, what did we mean by this? How does it apply to this yeah. emergent new situation that we never thought about? And, and that helps me give me some guidance yeah. as to what to do. It also gives me all the experience of 30, 40, 50 years of people trying these things and failing. Those are baked in to the ethical principles. Ethics is a lot of just history. Ethics is just a lot of, we learned what we did wrong, so let's not do that again. I don't know if this one resonates for you, but listening to what you said, like I think like you talk, you mentioned ad tech, but I think there, there's a pattern that I've seen, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I've seen it emerge a little bit. I've even heard people, I think at like Facebook say this, where that idea of like, this data can never leave the device kind of idea, right? Yeah. That's that's kind of an ethical principle, right? Yeah. This data that's a constitution. Know, like yeah, constitutionally, it's my mental, data. Yeah. It doesn't go, it doesn't get sent. Yeah. Um, they haven't quite gotten to the point of saying it's my data. They've at least said I can control the data, but mm -hmm. but certainly once it's in the public space, they consider the cloud public. Yeah. Uh, once it's out in that space, all bets are off. I lose all control of it. So the more that we can keep it on our personal devices the more control we have over it. And so that becomes yeah. one of those yeah. bedrock principles, absolutely. It does feel like privacy and data privacy is at the core of what so many of us are talking about. I mean, you have people like Cory Doctorow talking about it from very different and amazing angles, right? But we're all kind of, we're all kind of wrangling with this idea of data privacy and how unknowingly, how, how, how subtle the harm can be if we violate that privacy, right? Even, even if we mean well. Um, yeah, that seems like one. Corey and I would agree on almost everything except how effective the tech is. Like I think that that he argues that that Facebook benefits from people thinking that this technology can actually influence minds and get you to buy things because then they get more ad dollars. So they've never tried to dispel. They've never come up and said, you know, our tech doesn't really work that well. We honestly can't convince people that ads actually make any difference whatsoever. They'll never say that because that's a bread and butter right now. Um, so he thinks that they're lying uh, and saying that it, you know, they're hiding the fact that it's not at all effective. I've studied the tech enough, especially when you get into eye tracking and things that are very close to mind reading and understand enough about how our senses can be fooled yeah. in normal human ways, the ways the magicians have exploited for hundreds of years, yeah. thousands maybe. Um, if you know any of the tricks of magic, you know humans are exploitable. Yeah. And to the extent that the technology uses those same tricks, which a lot of advertising does, we are exploitable. And, and, and what's at risk here is not that they'll know my birthday or know how big my feet are or anything that's, that I consider personal. Um, the risk is that whatever information they have, they can use to push my buttons. And so what's yeah. at risk is cognitive liberty. It's really, you know, this hmm. this is one of the, the uh, Bill of Rights that I wish had been written differently. In addition to the Second Amendment, I wish that the Third and Fourth Amendment had been written in a way that it made the context explicit. Why was it wrong for the, for the, the New Americas to say, that soldiers can't be quartered in our house. It isn't because of the expense of quartering a soldier in your house. It's because if you were a revolutionary and you had a British soldier staying upstairs, they would find you out and you would probably get killed. And so it's a kind of mental privacy that people had had the sanctity of their homes to express right. their disdain for the British Empire uh, without being tattled on. And, and that's what the technology is doing to us now. It's basically for government purposes of, of governments that are authoritarian, it's calling out their enemies to them that they can then deal with physically. And for ad tech companies, 
it's telling us in which ways are we susceptible to manipulation so yeah. that they can come in and push our buttons and trigger us in a way that is predictable, testable. It's just like a Skinner box. We're, we're trapped in the Skinner box and they can learn about it and, and push our buttons into the point where we lose our ability to think for ourselves across the board. And that's when you start seeing uh, politics abusing this so that people can get themselves elected. They, they have for years, but it's just been such a gross ineffective manipulation that political ads are so yeah. bad that th that, yeah. that nobody worries about them. But as soon as you can target somebody to say, abortion is your hoppet issue. So I'm going to show Hillary yeah. Clinton yeah. being the opposite of you so that you will vote against Hillary Clinton no matter what else you know, no matter right. what your best interest is, right. Right. you will vote against her. That's a manipulation that can change the course of history. You know, having a humility, right? Having a degree of humility about the range of your own ability to say, think clearly, seems like a critical example of that. Like if we are humble, I, I, I don't know, I've found in my many conversations and intersections with people, you know, I've had the good fortune because of largely second life to, to go and like meet like a lot of different people. And I found that I think there is a real razor there to apply, which is the people that just are so, uh, have no humility, right? Believe that they can do anything and yeah. they can understand anything and yeah. they can be objective under any conditions. I don't know. Those people are just, uh, there's just a real danger to that, you know? I, I agree. And I'm, 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 I'm so glad you said that because somebody who's, you know, started companies and made a lot of money can, can <laughs> easily be one of those masters of the universe type people yeah. who feel like they're infallible. Yeah. And that's the most important growth is to realize what our limits are. Yeah. Uh, as a leader or, or as a human being, it's important to know yeah. those things and then to know that, that, you know, the day that Elon Musk realizes that he didn't hit a home run, that he was born on third right. base, he had all the advantages. And it's yeah. not that he's that smart. He's just been super lucky in the choices he's made. Actually, the thing that's most important about him is he has no aversion to risk. He's taken some tremendous risks with other people's money that most people would have shied away from <laughs> taking. But that, that that aversion to risk also yeah. gets him to do really stupid things as well. Like as we've seen with Twitter, uh, yeah, um, so yeah. so you're in a much better position as a yeah. leader to to have the uh, introspection and humility to know that about yourself, and it's something I've struggled with as well. If I, you know, some of my early companies, if I had stayed in those companies, I'd be super rich, right? Yeah. I'm not doing poorly, but 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 I would have you know hundreds of millions of dollars based yeah. on the stock I had in some of those early companies if I had just stuck with it. And I could have been on that road, but I would have never learned. I would have never had the beatings that I needed in life to be able to actually go, am I doing something wrong? So let, me, let me rethink you this. You wouldn't jump in it. You know, in, in closing, you, you wouldn't jump in a time machine and edit your life. You'd take it as it's been, regardless of the opportunity for greater. I think uh, the on, only thing I would, I would have done differently is I would have said, uh, I took risks early on. I took a lot of risks, even joining my first startup, et cetera. But I would have, said, I would have probably told myself, you know, uh, on the dating front, don't don't spend your time waiting for the right person. Like that was a stupid decision <laughs> on my part. Date, actually go meet everybody because you need the skills you're going to get from being beaten up by bad dating in order to be a better human for the time wow. where you do find the person that you really want to be with. I didn't I didn't get that till till late, and I what wish I could have got those years back. What an amazing closing thought, right? Like have the have the humility and have the curiosity to to date. Uh, and I guess you can kind of say that broadly and apply that to so many different things, yeah, right? Try like, things. Yeah. Try don't experiment. work at one company or, you know, you yeah. know, d literally date different people, but, uh, take risks, even if you think that the chances of success are low, as long as it's not going to cripple you, as long as it's not going to put you in the, in the poor house, that, that it's okay to take those risks, especially when you're younger, because that's, that's what it's for. That's what youth is for is messing up. Uh, so well, it's, it's good to feel like you're still doing it though you know yeah. like you're still doing a lot of different things and taking risks and um and i think helping out people a lot so appreciate that it's good to have you doing that it's good to have you on here it's been thank great you. to talk thank you it's been super fun <laughs> cool.